We're going through the Gospel of Mark, uh, you know, just chapter by chapter, and we come now to the end of chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, turn there, Mark chapter 13. We're going to be looking at 28, verse 28 through 37. And so what I've been doing uh, at the beginning of every sermon is giving us the structure of Mark 13 because it is a complicated passage There's a lot of different interpretations and ways to interpret this, but I personally think this is the best way to interpret it. And so let me just give you a recap really quick. So if this is your first time here, uh, you could get a, you're not super lost. Um, So we looked at Mark 13, 1 through 23 in two sermons. Those, uh, Those verses are talking about the events that happened um, in the first century. Those those were events that happened in the times of Jesus' disciples. And if you remember, at Jesus' time, and if you remember, essentially here's what those verses said. The disciples asked Jesus a question. Jesus, when and what are the signs of the destruction of the temple? Because Jesus said it was going to be destroyed. And so Jesus said, hey, look, um, I'm going to give you some general signs, like just generally things that normally happen already. Um, one, there's going to be a lot of false messiahs, and they're going to try to lead the people of God astray. Uh, two, there's going to be a lot of persecution and tribulation, and so you got to watch out for these things. And so he gave them these general signs to look for that are going to precede the destruction of the temple. And then he gave them a specific sign they needed to watch out for for the destruction of the temple. Uh, he said, guys, uh, you got to really watch out for this because if when you see this, you know it's going to be towards the end, of the destruction of the temple. And so that was the abomination of desolation. If you remember what the abomination of desolation was, essentially a Jewish um, leader who was revolting against Rome um, really desecrated the temple. He went into the temple and he appointed a high priest who wasn't supposed to be there, which is, which is a big no-no. Uh, he murdered people in the temple and he used the temple as his military headquarters. And so that was the abomination of desolation. And so when Jesus said, hey, when you look at these, when you see these things, know that the destruction is coming. Then we looked at the events of the end of the age, essentially when Jesus is coming back. We looked at those things uh, last week, and we know that a lot of these things that we, a lot of the times we tend to think are literal, right? Like the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give light. Those are figurative things, essentially saying Jesus is coming back. Like Jesus is coming back and he's returning to rescue his people one day. And so now we're at the very end of Mark 13 where Jesus is going to give us two parables. And these two parables uh, kind of align with uh, the destruction of the temple in 7 AD, the first parable. And the second parable is a parable that explains the end of the age. And so I wanted to give you just some context there so you, could, uh, so you have something to, to really... Um, Uh, grasp this text that we're going to be looking at today. But if you have your Bible, let's read the word of God today. Mark 13, verse 28, it says this. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. Here's the first parable. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And then he goes into the second parable, verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands a doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We honor you. Thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us today. Speak to your people through your word. Speak to your people through your spirit, God. Encourage us. 
challenge us. May we become more and more like you. God, I pray that you would be clear today at the changes in our life, the things that we need to change, the perspective in our minds and our hearts that we need to change. God, may your word, as powerful as it is, just transform our heart. May today not just be another Sunday that we come and just check off the box, but may this Sunday, may today, may your word just transform us into your image. God, we honor you. We devote our hearts today. We devote our minds today to you and to your word. God, we sit under your word, and we thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever had guests unexpectedly show up at your house? Have you ever had guests unexpectedly show up at your house? Maybe it was a friend or maybe it was a family member, but they really caught you like you're not, you don't have your makeup on, you're just in your house clothes. Anyone ever been, anyone, anyone ever been caught that way? I don't Jeez, nobody. That's awesome. Okay, a few of you. All right, cool. Uh, you know, I. You know, I, honestly, I, there's a few times where, where, uh, where I've been uh, caught kind of unexpectedly, and uh, it was not super, super fun. But I really remember this one time, where I really, really was just. I had some guests at my house that I wasn't expecting at all. I was a youth pastor at this time, and. Uh, so uh, it was my birthday, uh, by the way, January 16th, so feel free to put it in your phone if you want. But uh, it was my birthday, I was a youth pastor, and um, so a, a group of leaders and students, along with my brother, he's over here laughing because he knows where I'm going, uh, they said, hey, it's going to be super fun if we just show up. And uh, at like four or five in the morning and just scare the heck out of Johnny, let's go ahead and do that. So that's what they did. I was in bed. Like just in bed, getting my beauty rest because it takes a lot of rest to look this good, and um, and so next thing you know, uh, my apparently while I was asleep, my brother opened the door. He let in a leader come in and a couple of students, and they had like a they had a, a, a crash cymbal with drums. I think they had a trumpet. I can't remember what it was, but anyway, so they started banging as hard and as loud as they could. And I, I'm not kidding you. I'm, by the grace of God, I didn't have a heart attack. Like, no joke. I just remember waking up and, like, that's literally, what, that's literally what I did. I was like, oh, my, I was super, super scared. I did not expect them at all. And I was actually a little ticked off, but I couldn't go crazy in front of my students. Spirit of God was holding me back. Uh, but then they decided, you know, they thought, they thought it was funny to, uh, put earrings on me. They put a tiara on me. They put a, uh, a tie on me. I actually have a picture of that. And they took me to IHOP like this, okay? They took me to IHOP like this. And yeah, that's, that's what happens when you're a youth pastor, things like that. But I, I guess I rocked it. You got to rock, got to rock it with confidence. I mean, you got to wear whatever you wear with confidence. And so they took me to IHOP and people were just like, this dude is weird. Like this dude is weird. Uh, but they, again, they totally show up unexpectedly, and now um, I lock my doors. I have five security cameras in my house, and yeah, I just, need, I'm just, I just need some dogs, some dogs, some guard dogs. But they showed up unexpectedly. Do you know who else is going to show up unexpectedly and suddenly? Jesus. Suddenly. Unexpectedly. And so the big question for today, church, is this. Are we ready for his reception? Are we ready for his reception? My favorite pastors, Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon says, it is idle, worthless. He said, it is idle to talk about looking for the second coming if we never set our house in order and never put ourselves in readiness for his reception. It's one thing to talk about his second coming. It's another thing to be ready for his second coming. And he's coming. He's coming. He might come in our lifetime, might not, but he's coming one day. Are you ready for his reception? Are you ready for it? How will he find us? How, he, how will he find you? 
How will he find me? In what spiritual condition will he find us? If Christ came back today, how will he find us? How will he find you? So the big goal for today is this, church, is to answer these two questions. How does Jesus want to find us at his return? And why does he want to find us that way? Like, why does it matter that he finds us the way he wants to find us? That's what we're going to do. So again, we're going to look at this passage and then really figure out what it means to us today in 20. 22. So let's just look at, uh, at the scriptures. Turn with me in your Bible today. Verse 28, it says this. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put on its leaves, you know that summer is near. And so Jesus is using this first parable to really explain something. You see, the fig tree would lose its leaves in uh, the fall. And then in around March or April, it would have new leaves. It would bring in new leaves. And so when people would see these new leaves on the fig tree, they knew that summer was coming. So when people saw the the trees coming or the trees, um, uh, the leaves with trees, not leaves with trees, trees with leaves, they knew that summer uh, was was coming. See what happens when, when students scare you that much, it affects your brain. That's what it is. And so that's what Jesus is saying. When you see the leaves on this tree, you know that summer is coming. And then he attaches it to something. He's trying to make a point with this first parable. He says in verse 29, So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Now, what are these things that Jesus is talking about? He says, when you see these things, what are these things talking about? Is Is he talking about what precedes this passage? Is he talking about, because remember last week we talked about the coming of the Son of Man, right? The the coming of the Son of Man. A lot of people, again, believe it's literal, that there's going to be these natural disasters and that Jesus is coming. Is he talking about, is this an end time passage? Is he talking about those things? I don't think he is. I don't think he's talking about the end times. I think what he's talking about here, these things that he refers to are the things that he was referring to in verses 5 through 23. Remember, Uh, the false messiahs that are coming. Be careful. Don't be led astray. There's persecution, tribulation. You're going to be put before councils and you're going to be beaten. You're going to to go through. That's what he is referring to. Now, let me tell you why I don't think this is an end time parable and it's a parable that relates to the events of of the of the destruction of the temple notice this in your bibles i want you to really notice this i think we sometimes we 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 don't make these connections but he says in verse 29 you also see these things right so also when you see these things and then notice what he says in verse 30 right truly i say to you this generation will not pass away until all these things take place So he says, watch it when you see these things and all these things will take place. When do we see these things and all these things for the very first time? We see them in Mark chapter 13, verse 4, when Jesus' disciples were asking him a question about what? Not the end times, the destruction of the temple. Notice this. Tell us, they're asking Jesus, when will these things? things right be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished do you see that so it's not relating to the end time it's referring back to the disciples question about the destruction of the temple so this is not an end time thing this is this nothing like that so again it refers to the intense persecution tribulation that that the people of the first century were going to go through and notice what he says In verse 29, he says, you know that he is near. He is near. So if if you're interpreting this passage as an end time passage, he makes sense. But I, I just don't think that the word he is the best word to use here. Because here's the thing. The word he actually in the original language is a third person singular verb. So it, it word. And so it could really refer to he, it, or she. You could translate it any way you want, depending on the context. And so I think that the best way to translate it is it, right? When you, 
uh, you know that it is near. It is near. It is at the very gate. So, no, so what is near then? Well, I think the, the best way to interpret that is when you see all of these signs, right? Intense persecution, false, false messiahs, tribulation. You know that it is near. What's the it? The abomination of desolation, right? The, the, the events that lead to the destruction of the temple. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about Jesus, that he's at the very gates. No, this is a, a first century passage. That's what he's talking about. And so in sum, Jesus, or just as the leaves on a fig tree point to the coming of summer, so the signs that Jesus described in verse 5 through 23 point to the coming of the abomination of desolation and the destruction of the temple. So Jesus is telling his disciples, be watchful for these things. Be alert. Be awake for these things. Be, be on the lookout for these types of things. Verse 30, this is what he says. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things, all these things, take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Here's another reason why I think that this parable relates to a first century and not to the end times. He says, this generation. He's talking to the disciples and and that generation, the generation of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, every time the, the phrase this generation was used, it always talked about Jesus' contemporaries. He's not talking about a future generation in the end times. He's talking about the generation in that time. And Jesus says, you know, this generation, my generation, your generation, disciples, is not going to pass away until the destruction of the temple. And that's exactly what happened. Now, what's really interesting is that a a generation in biblical terms it's about 40 years it's about 40 years so this happened in around 33 AD when Jesus is having this conversation and the destruction of the temple happened in 70 AD and that's exactly what happened that generation did not pass away in other words let me put it this way Jesus's words proved true what Jesus predicted what Jesus prophesied every single thing that Jesus said came true Everything, the destruction of the temple, the abomination of the desolation, the tribulations, the, um, uh, the persecution, the false messiahs, everything proved true. And I think that's the way Jesus ends this, this parable. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The parable ends with Jesus' personal guarantee of his words, that they're trustworthy, that they're more permanent than creation, that they're imperishable. And again, everything that Jesus said came true, it came true, it's church. It gives us confidence, doesn't it, in Jesus, that everything he said would come true. But again, I think the main point of this parable is watch out, disciples. Be alert, watch out for these things. And then he shifts gears really in a weird way to the end times. In verse 32, he says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. And so he's using the word but there as a transitional word. He's he's transitioning into a new theme, into a new subject, into a new idea. And he says concerning that day or that hour. The phrase that day always, always, always is in reference to the second coming of Christ. Now we're talking about the end times. Now this is a parable of the end times. That day always refers to the second coming and return of Christ. Matthew chapter 7, 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And Jesus said, I never knew you on that day. 2 Timothy 1, 12. Paul's telling uh, Timothy about him suffering. He says, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day that has been entrusted to me. That day, the return of Christ. That's what he's saying here. And notice what Jesus says. No one knows. No one knows when Christ is coming back. Us men, we don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter what that YouTuber prophet said. We don't know. Like we, no one knows when he's coming back. The angels don't know. And guess what? At this point, 
Jesus didn't know either. Only the Father. Only the Father knows, which is so weird to me that so many believers get caught up with these false prophecies of the end times. So far, 100% of prophecies have failed after people have said, God told me the world was going to end. I calculated the times and numbers and dates, and this is the number I got, and it failed. Assemblies of God, and it ha- this happens to almost every denomination, said, made a statement that the world was going to end and Christ was going to come back before World War I was over. We're still here. No one knows. The Calvary, Calvary Chapel denomination predicted that Christ would come back before 1981. They said they were sure. On uh, New Year's Eve, they gathered at the church because Christ was going to come back. After they crossed over to 1982, they just went home because he didn't come back because no one knows. Harold Camping, family, family radio, Christian radio host, predicted that the rapture would happen May 21, 2011 at 6 p.m. and claimed the Bible as his source. And he said that the rapture was going to happen time zone by time zone. Jesus said no one knows the day or hour when he's coming back. The Jehovah's Witness, it doesn't even, it doesn't have to be a Christian prediction. The Jehovah's Witness predicted that the end would come in 1975. In 1974, people were praised for selling their, their homes and focusing on evangelism. Could you imagine you selling your home because you believe the leader and prophet that said that Jesus was going to come back and sell your house and and use your resources to spread the message? And Jesus didn't come back? I'd be really upset. I would be super upset. Let me make it clear. No one knows when he's coming back. No one knows. No one knows. And especially lately with Everything that's happening on in the world. I turn on the TV or YouTube or whatever. Again, prediction after prediction. No one knows the day or the hour. Don't, don't, be, don't be led astray with these false predictions, man. Just don't. Another question I have for you. Angels don't know. Man doesn't know. Only God knows. Jesus doesn't know. Question for you. If Jesus is God... How does he not know when he's coming if he knows all? If he's omniscient, meaning all-knowing, how does he not know when he's coming? What would you tell an unbeliever that says, hey, I'm, I want to trust in Christ, but I'm having some issues because I was reading the Bible. I was reading Mark chapter 13, and I was reading end time stuff, and it says Jesus doesn't know, but I thought he's God. I thought he, how would you respond to that? Do you have an answer? Are you ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you? Let me help you out if you don't. I think Philippians chapter 2 gives us some insight. Verse 6 through 8. It says, who, though talking about God, talking about Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is important, verse 7. But emptied himself By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus emptied himself at his incarnation when when he became a man. He emptied himself. Now, what is, I got to say it, this does not mean that Jesus stopped being God. Jesus never stopped being God. Jesus is always 100% man and 100% God. But as he came down as man in his incarnation, he laid aside some divine privileges that he had prior to his incarnation. Some of those privileges included the use of certain attributes in certain situations like we're seeing now. The attribute of omniscience, of him 
knowing everything, he laid that aside in certain times and in certain situations. Let me give you an example where he does know everything. Remember in John chapter 4 where he meets the woman at the well. Remember that. And they're having a conversation and he says, hey, uh, I know that the guy you're with right now is, is not your husband. You, you, you've had multiple husbands. How did he know that? Because he's all-knowing, right? But in that certain scenario, he used that attribute of omniscience. In this scenario, he laid it aside at the Father's direction. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I like that. I'm getting some head nods. All right, good. Does he know now? You bet he does. All authority after his resurrection, all authority has been given to him. He knows now. There's a date and a time, and he knows it, and he's coming back. Verse 33 says this. He says, be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. The phrase here, be on guard, has this sense of watch carefully. Be on alert, right? That's what he's saying here. To keep awake also has this sense of being alert. Don't be sleeping. And so the reason why Jesus is telling his disciples to be alert, to be watchful, to be wakeful, why? Because of the uncertainty of his return. They have no idea he could come any minute, any second. He can come. And so Jesus is saying, hey, guys, be on alert, be watchful, be, be ready, especially because we don't know when he's coming. And then verse 34 is when he gives the parable. He says, it is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. A lot of the times we try to allegorize this parable and try to say, okay, who's a doorkeeper, who's a servant? He, I think that's reading into the text a little bit, but I think we just need to understand the main point of the parable. The main point of the parable is that there's a doorkeeper. There's some doorkeepers that Jesus told to stay awake. Who are the doorkeepers? Followers of Christ, you and I, right? And they must stay awake and be ready and be watchful for the return of the man, for the return of the owner. That's essentially the basic point of the parable, be ready. As a doorkeeper, be watchful because you do not know when the Son of Man is going to return. Verse 35, therefore stay awake for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. Those four divisions, they are Roman divisions of the day. Verse 36, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And so Jesus says, therefore, stay awake because I can return at any point. Because the Son of God, the Son of Man can return at any point. Stay awake. This is the second time we see Jesus' command to stay awake. Second time that Jesus says, stay awake. And one time he already says, be on, be on alert, be watchful. And then he says, why? He tells us the reason why we need to be watchful and wakeful and alert. He says this, lest I come suddenly and find you asleep. The idea of sleep in the Bible, listen closely, church, is a metaphor for spiritual dullness. It's, it's a metaphor for spiritual indifference, for spiritual complacency, for spiritual ineffectiveness. Believer today, let me tell you this, don't let him catch you asleep. Don't let him catch you spiritually asleep, complacent, going through the motions, checking the box, playing church. Enough's enough. Enough's enough. We can't play church. Our purpose is far too great. Our mission is far too big to be sleeping. God doesn't use the ones who sleep. He uses the ones who are awake, ready to be used by him. Don't let him catch you asleep. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 6, for you are children of light. 
You can't shine your light in a dark world when you're asleep. Children of the day, we are not of the night or of the darkness, let darkness, so let us not sleep as others do. Let other people sleep. You don't sleep. You stay awake. There's a purpose for your life. You're on a mission here on this earth. I grew up charismatic, church. I'm a little Pentecostal. You know what's interesting? Next chapter, the disciples are caught sleeping. The disciples are caught sleeping the next chapter. And you know what that gives me? Hope. Because sometimes Jesus needs to remind me a thousand times before I get it. And even if they were caught sleeping, they woke up, something woke them up, and God used them to change the world. Wake up today. Wake up today. Wake up today. God wants to use you today. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Verse 37. He says, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay Awake. Jesus is looking at his disciples. He says, what I say to you, 12, what I say to you, I say to all. What I say to you, 12, I say to Restoration Church in 2022. He's telling us today, stay awake. Stay awake. Notice he, he, he in, in seven verses, four times, he says, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, be on guard. Four times in seven verses. That is Jesus trying to make a point. And so here's the thing. If I can wrap this, this parable, these two parables up in one sentence. What's the main idea of this passage? If you're going to remember anything, remember this. Remember this. Write this down. God didn't call us to predict the future, but to be faithful in the present. You see, when we talk about end times all the time, we're trying to predict the future, when he's coming. We get so caught up in the details that don't really matter. Jesus not once said, hey, I think you should sit down at a small group and try to predict the future. He never said that. What he says, I think that you should live faithfully while you're here preaching the gospel and loving the lost and the broken and the hurting. That's what he said. And so, church, we have a huge, huge opportunity to be used by God. We do. And our call is not to predict the future, but be faithful and watchful and wakeful in the present. So the big question is this, what does it look like, right? Because I could tell you how to be watchful, or I could tell you to be watchful and wakeful, but what does it really mean? Like, what does it really mean? How can we really put some flesh on these bones? What does it look like? Well, the good thing is that Scripture gives us an idea of what it looks like to be watchful and wakeful, as we wait on the Lord Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, but since we belong to that day, let us be sober. It has the idea of being watchful again, being alert, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, uh, the hope of salvation. So as we live on this earth, watchful and wakeful, he says, faith, love, and hope. Live with great faith today. Live with great faith today. Live with great love for God and the people of God. Love him unconditionally. Love the people in your life unconditionally. Love the people who are hard to love unconditionally, right? We all know those, and if they're sitting next to you, do not look at them, do not look at them. Because here's the thing. Sometimes we're that person that's hard to love, right? Sometimes we're that person. And so Jesus said, hey, and so this, this passage says, hey, to be watchful is to be a person of faith. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your faith. 
Don't lose your love for God and his people. Don't lose your hope regardless of your circumstances. You have hope beyond the grave. You have a blessed hope that's coming back. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 13 through 14 says, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. It has like a military term to be courageous. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Again, be watchful. How do you, how do you live watchfully? Again, with faith, right? It says with faith. With conviction, stand firm. Don't be led astray. Stand firm in your convictions of the word. Stand firm in your belief. Stand firm in preaching the gospel. Stand firm in loving people. Stand firm in your faith as you're being ridiculed or tested or whatever it may be or even tempted. Stand firm. Act like men. Be courageous. Be courageous. Will Jesus come back and, and, and find you courageously living out the purpose that he's given you? Be strong. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. Continue steadfastly in what? In prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Watchfulness is connected to prayer and thanksgiving. Think about that. To be watchful means to pray and to get on your knees and ask God and beg God to work in the lives of the people you love, to work in your community, to work in, in the world. Prayer is about being, watchfulness is about being, being prayerful as well. With thanksgiving, have you ever thought about that? That as you wait on the Lord, part of you being watchful is thanking God for the things that he's given you today. The family that you have today, the friends you have today, the health you have today, every single breath that you have from God to be thankful for. That's what it looks like to be watchful. Ephesians 6, 18, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that, to that end. Keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for the saints. Be alert, be alert, keep alert. What? Perseverance. To be watchful, to live watchfully and wakefully is to persevere, to persevere to that day. It's not easy being a follower of Christ. It's not. Whoever sold you that, that if you become a Christian, everything's going to be perfect, that was a complete lie. If anything, there's a bullseye on your back. And you're going to require a lot of perseverance. And I'll tell you why in just a bit. But to live watchfully and wakefully is to persevere in the midst of trials and storms and difficult situations. He says making supplication for the saints, serving the saints, caring for the saints, caring for each other. To live watchfully and wakefully is to, to watch out for one another, to care for one another, to build one another up, to have unity within the church, to have peace within the church. To live wakefully, watchfully. Ephesians 5, two more, 15 through 16. Look carefully, again, look carefully, then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. What, making the best use of your time. You can't get more time. Be alert. Be watchful. Be wakeful with how you use your time here. I was just having a conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday. And we went on a cruise with them like a while back. And she's like, oh, you know, uh, man, they all have kids and stuff. And they're like, we know, they're all little babies. And they're like, we don't even know when the next time we're going to be able to go. Um, but you know what? We, we have a lot of time anyway. We, we have a lot of time. And that, I just thought about that. I'm like. No, we don't. I'm about to hit 40. No, we don't have a lot of time. Like, no, we got to go now. Like, I'm going to leave behind. Sorry, we have no kids. We're going. We don't have a lot of time. Scripture says that this life is a mist. It's a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. There is not enough time. Use your time wisely. Use your time for the Lord, for his kingdom, for his mission, for his purpose. How you use your time points to what you really value the most. What would the use of your time say about what you value the most? Be watchful, be wakeful, and lastly, this is so good, be sober-minded. 
Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. You're in a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual thing. And guess what? The enemy is trying to devour your life. Believer, listen closely. Believer, if the enemy can't send you to hell, he will make your life here a living hell. That's what he'll try to do. He will devour your hope. He will devour your peace, devour your joy, devour your satisfaction, devour your identity, devour your marriage, devour your friendships. He, would, he just wants to get rid of you. Be watchful. Be watchful. Stay alert. He's, he's running around trying to devour you, trying to stop you, trying to hinder you, trying to distract you from the calling and the purpose upon your life. Stay alert. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we stay alert? Here's why. Because it is the spiritually awake who will be used by God to revive the spiritually dead. That's why it matters. It is the spiritually awake that God will use to revive the spiritually dead. God can't use sleepy Christians. He can't. He uses those that are awake. We might be uncertain about his return, but one thing that we are certain of is the mission that he called us to to reach people far from God, to reach people who don't know him. Our vision says that we're passionate about helping people what? Know God, know God. To us here at Restoration, it's much more than a pretty cool vision statement that we put on our website when we're in our worship guide. It's not just letters on a page, it's a life that we live. That's why it matters to be awake. There's people in our lives who don't know him, who don't know him. And we gotta be awake. We have to be awake. Final question, I'm done. When Christ returns, how will he find you? Awake? That is my hope and my prayer for you, church. That he would find you awake. That he would find you effective, passionate, living the life that he's called you to live. Will he find you awake? Will he find you sleeping, complacent, indifferent, lack of passion, lack of purpose, sleeping? Or will he find you spiritually dead with no life in you, meaning you never came to saving faith in Jesus? You gotta come to know Christ before he comes back. You got him. He's your only hope. Your only hope. Place your faith in him. There's forgiveness at the cross. There's reconciliation. There's hope for today. There's peace for today. When we put our faith in Jesus, there's peace and hope for the future but only in Christ, only in Christ. Surrender and submit your life to him. That is the worst condition that you can be found in is spiritually dead. Because there's no hope. There's no hope. Let me pray. Will you stand with me, church, actually? God, we love you. Thank you for your people.
thank you for every single person here today. God, I pray through the power of your spirit may you draw through your sovereign grace those who are spiritually dead and quicken them to life in you, hope in you, restoration in you through the power of your spirit. May you give them life today. That eternal life starts today, that they are forgiven and redeemed and restored and reconciled to you, Jesus. Justified in you, saved by grace and faith in you, Jesus. God, I pray for the believers in here who maybe is just falling asleep. I pray you would wake them up today. Wake us up, church. God, wake us up, God including myself, may we be people here at Restoration Church who are passionate for you, who will not fall asleep, who will not get lazy, who will not put our guard down, but people of purpose, people of passion, people on mission, people with a message of the gospel. There's a God who saves and a God who loves. And Jesus, we pray as a church, come, Lord Jesus. Just like John prayed in Revelation, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. God, we pray that your son would come. Why? Because as believers, there's no condemnation. To live is Christ and to die is gain. God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you. In your name we pray.